Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much for coming out to this talk. I'm really excited to uh, share some thoughts with you today. I'm going to see if I can share a screen. And if at any time anybody has trouble hearing me or seeing the screen, please do just let me know. Um, my title today, Locked In and Screaming, What Neuroscience Can Say About Autistic Inertia. And I'll do a lot to unpack that over the next few um, minutes. Before I get started, I do want to say this work is sponsored by a number of organizations. The National Institute of Health has given a number of grants that supported this work. Um, in addition, I did some work on individual interventions for autism when I was a fellow at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies. And one disclosure, I do hold a patent through the University of Pittsburgh that's, a that's licensed by Apollo Neuroscience. I'll discuss research associated with the patent. I am not part of Apollo Neuroscience, but if they sell more products, I do get royalties. Um, before I get started, I also want to give a few content warnings. I'm going to speak very frankly today. Well, and what I'll say about them, please protect yourself. If you need to log off, if you need to shut off your camera, if you need to walk away for a while, that's all fine. I care more about you being healthy than I do you seeing my slides. I'm going to speak very frankly today about autism and also touch on PTSD, trauma, depression, and anxiety. I'm going to describe similarities of some features of autism to some features of psychiatric disorders. Um, also, you should know most of what I describe about autism will reflect work done in lower services needs autistic individuals, and I know that can be polarizing for people. It's just what we have the research in. And finally, I will use language of neurodivergence throughout this talk. As to who I am, as Emma said, and thank you for that introduction, I am an emotion neuroscience researcher at Pitt. I, my research centers on what happens when people are having emotions that they didn't bargain for or that they don't want to have and how to either help them or help society to accept that maybe that happens for people sometimes. I'm also an autism researcher. I have a number of grants in autism. I just want to highlight a center grant, the Autism Center of Excellence that Carla Mazewski is PI on, from which I'll be talking about some information, and also um, a grant that Kate Gotham at um, Rowan University is the PI on, who, with whom I've done a bunch of work that I'll talk about today. Finally, I am autistic. Um, I was diagnosed at seven years old. At the time, my parents were told that if I ever got wind of this or the school did, that it would actually be quite detrimental. I would be taken out of gifted programs and put into special education programs, and they didn't want that. Um, so instead, they just told me I was very sensitive, and I went through my whole life thinking I was a sensitive soul, and that sometimes got in the way of me. And then when I became an autism researcher, I started finding that a whole lot of stuff seemed to fit from what I was learning, and um, ended up asking about it and have identified as autistic for the past few years. Um, there have been things that I've heard through my whole life that I haven't been able to square with my experience. People have said, if you're upset, why do you sometimes not say so? Why can't you just say you're upset when you're upset? And it's like, but my mouth doesn't open that way. Sometimes they, people will say, if you don't like what you're hearing, just don't listen. Well, what if stuff gets in and I can't actually help it? People will say, well, if you don't like what's happening, you can just use your own two feet and walk away. And what if that's sometimes really, really difficult to do? And I haven't had a framework for saying why. And then, of course, the one I love best that a lot of people think is interesting is people who say, this thing that you're hung up on that you're really upset about now, why don't you just think about that later when you have time? And what if we don't always get a choice in that? What's a framework for talking about all of these phenomena? Recently, people who are autistic have been posting on the web about something they're calling autistic inertia. The research world, frankly, has not caught up to it, but there are a few publications just starting. Really though, I would say if you wanna know about autistic inertia, Reddit groups and um, websites where autistic people are talking about their lived experiences are your best friends right now. 
autistic inertia is roughly defined as the tendency of an autistic person to stay on a thing, a task, a thought, or an emotion state, unless they're stopped by something extraordinary, a huge act of will, or something external that really absorbs your attention. I'm not going to say it's all bad. In fact, it can be really useful to be able to pay attention to a thing for a very long time, especially something that involves attention to minute details. The Israeli army employs autistic people to find um, anomaly, anomalies that are weapons caches on aerial images because autistic people tend, tend to be able to sit and look at these tiny little details for hours at a time. That said, when this level of focus, this level of involuntary investment such that you stay in a state starts happening when you don't want it to, it can lead to difficulties. Difficulties getting going or stopping a task that you are not currently doing. Difficulties getting out of a train of thought or an emotion spiral or mobilizing the kind of resources that would allow you to ask for help um, or regulate emotions. So this is what people describe autistic inertia as. Today, I want to talk about some of the science that might try and tell us what it's about at the level of the brain. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be appealing to the science that is often not about autism because we just don't have that work yet. But there are a lot of phenomena that are kind of like it, which we can appeal to. If you do have questions, by the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. Emma can interrupt or, or just, um, if it's a clarifying class question, interrupt. Otherwise, I'll try and leave some time at the end for us. So um, I'll talk about these phenomena that autistic inertia is like. And what I'm going to come to is a model of sort of being locked inside, knowing that things are really difficult and very emotional. And you might even scream about it inside, but that stuff doesn't translate outside to where you would ask for help. Um, and if you believe me on that much, then I want to talk about, so what do we do about it? Potentially, we can address it at an individual level by helping people reintegrate the aspects of their mind that are locked in with their body that could walk away or regulatory resources. I also want to talk, though, about addressing this at a societal level. And this is really where the social determinants of health and um, neurodivergence framework fits in saying, what if society just had an increased understanding that autistic inertia is a thing? And maybe that could help un unpack where things that autistic people frequently experience, like meltdowns and shutting down in the face of stress, fit in for people and give people a bit more empathy for it. All right, so let's get started. Um, this year, we had the fortune to um, be able to submit a meta-analysis of 244 brain imaging studies of autism. And we looked at areas of the brain that were systematically over all of these studies, different between autistic and non-autistic people when they were processing information, that is functional imaging studies that imaged the brain while it was doing something. Places that came out, areas of the brain that are involved in recognizing information as important or salient came out um, and generating emotions from that. Also areas of the brain that do executive control, that is help you think about what you want to, when you want to, these acted differently in autistic people. And finally, areas of the brain like the, and this is like the dorsolateral or prefrontal cortex, areas of the brain that are responsible for what we call introceptive processing or processing of, um, what do I say? Um, what's going on in your body, knowing that your body is having a feeling um, or knowing that you're having a sensation. These are um, different in autistic versus not autistic people. So let's put that into a model of what's likely happening. Suppose something that is maybe vaguely threatening is present in your environment, something, some shadow that's looming near you or your clothes are just a little extra scratchy in a way that's uncomfortable. This threat puts information to the salience detecting information systems, which say, yeah, that's something important, which ideally then recruit our control systems that say, oh yeah, I know what to do about it. I can neutralize that threat. 
and stop a cycle. What if that doesn't happen? What if these connections, for example, are very strong or these connections are not as strong or we don't have these connections to be able to mobilize our external resources? Then you get feedback loops where that salient system, that is the thing that finds something important and vigilant, ends up just getting more and more activated. Areas that attend to the body project to both of these areas and that can augment these this threat related processing by saying, gosh, the hair on my neck is standing up. I must be even more uncomfortable than I thought. And it turns out people who are autistic are very good at perceiving their bodies and body cues and reading into them. And so they may get fairly upset when their body has one of these reactions. So you could see how minor variation in a system like this could lead to a lot of the phenomena we're talking about. Turns out these phenomena have been looked at in people who aren't autistic. So for example, we've looked at people who get depressed and when people are depressed and you show them something negative and say, is this relevant to your life? Areas like that salient system, areas like the amygdala that are part of the threat detection salient system come on and stay on in a depressed person more than in people who are not depressed. And areas that are involved in that executive control, the prefrontal cortex, turns off in depressed compared to not depressed people. In not depressed people, they're very well related and correlated. And in depressed people, that correlation is nearer to zero. So you can say when somebody is emotionally um, or is in a state where their emotions have taken over for them and they're very sad for weeks at a time, Vigilance goes up, control goes down, and these systems don't talk to each other. So regulatory control of emotion gets shut off. What if that's the everyday in autism? We looked for this. Um, we showed autistic people emotional faces that were negative or fearful. And we showed them to neurotypical people, autistic people, and depressed people. And what you can see, the depressed people have pupillary reactivity. Your pupil dilates when any of these brain areas are very active, and that's very high in the depressed people. Somewhere in the middle for the autistic people who gradually build, especially for angry faces, to where the depressed people are. And it's not so much that way for the neurotypical people. Well, so then you would ask, which autistic people are they? The ones who ruminate more, not the depressed ones so much, but the ones who ruminate more. Um, look more like our depressed people. So an autistic person who tends to ruminate on negative things and go over them has this sustained reactivity. The very depressed autistic people also have that, but even the moderately ruminative people do. So what do we do with that? It means we can maybe use research on rumination to understand this locked in and spinning kind of effect. And it turns out Autistic adults in general do have this elevated and repetitive negative thinking and rumination. So rumination turns out to be high levels of activity in the amygdala, these salient systems, and low activity in these control regions. Um, if you ruminate on events, it's also high levels of activity in regions that are associated with memory of those events that are sustained long after a stimulus. So this stimulus was shown for a tenth of a second. 30 seconds later, the ruminative people are still having sustained amygdala activity to it. It's like they get stuck. But there's more. There are other brain systems that I want to highlight, one of which I want to just characterize for you for a moment is the cerebellum. It turns out that areas that control movement and control our ability to use our limbs and direct our eyes like we would want to are very much different in autistic versus non-autistic people in um, anatomy, neurotransmitter function, neuroinflammation. And there are these lovely models of how that can lead to some autistic symptomatology. Um, this review by Fatimi et al. from 2012, I commend to you. Turns out that the same region, the cerebellum, same cerebellar regions actually, are associated with um, that are associated with integrating mind and body are different in depressed people than 
non-depressed people. And even once you treat their depression, these abnormalities remain. You can treat their depression with therapy, cognitive therapy, so they think differently, but the way their body responds doesn't get treated. And we think that has to do with why they might get depressed again and again. It's a vulnerability factor. It's a factor that will predispose you to having reactions that you can't control because your body is doing its own thing. I'm gonna also suggest these sustained reactions to emotional stimuli by extra recruitment of these neural vigilance systems are not that far off from most people's experience. And I'll come back to this theme later, but it turns out you just have to hike up the level of extreme for neurotypical people. So Bill Guerin is a lovely researcher at Penn State who gives people an anger inducing interview. He asks them about their sexual adequacy and says, really, I wouldn't have imagined for you. Um, and it turns out that these folks take a long time to recover from an anger induction. And if an hour later you remind them of what happened, their blood pressure shoots back up. But we find it even throughout the animal kingdom. It turns out if you shock a rat's foot, it has sustained amygdala activity and sustained norepinephrine, the stress neurochemical released in the vicinity of the amygdala for the next four hours. So reacting to really aversive things for a long time is actually fairly typical. My contention is that for people with aut for autistic people, um, there's a lot of things that rise to that more extreme level. For example, eye contact. Um, a study in 2017 had autistic people look at faces and they put a cross where they were supposed to look. So please don't look away from the fear from the faces. And it turns out that when that happened, the autistic people's amygdala went up through the roof, didn't happen for the neurotypical people for both happy and fearful faces. So it's not just fearful faces, it's pretty much any face is gonna get that amygdala activity. It's extra recruitment of these vigilance systems. So it sets you on edge and you can't get out of it. Carla Mazewski and I did a study now um, almost 10 years ago that just got published where we looked at what brain areas were very active when we showed autistic people, this negative information, negative words. And it turns out wherever we looked, the interoceptive areas like the insula were way more active in the autistic than the not autistic people. The regulatory systems were actually firing um, too. Areas that are associated with um, social processing were firing. So it's not that the brain is inactive, it's more active in the autistic person compared to the neurotypical person. Anyone who says the autistic brain is shutting down, that's not what happened. It's a very active brain. That said, I'm gonna suggest it doesn't translate to mobilizing re regulatory resources in part because it doesn't translate to the body. So this could be thought of like a freeze response and we've got lots of research on freeze responses where if you show people an angry face, their eyes freeze looking at the angry face compared to something like a happy face. And their heart rate decelerates in the threat condition with the freeze with the angry face compared to the um, safe condition. So what we're seeing here is um, a distinction between what's going on in the brain, which might be very active, and then what's going on in the body. Turns out this happens in animals too. If you expose an animal to social defeat and then look over the next four weeks, and this is a really sad slide, folks, um, the percent of time that it spends immobile over the next two weeks goes up and up and up. So one incidence of bullying makes the animal physiologically shut down over two weeks to where it just is spending 50% of its time immobile. Physiological shutting down is not exclusive to autistic people. It's just it might take something a little more extreme for other people. We've looked in people with a variety of um, psychiatric conditions, and in every case, we get this pattern of whatever brain network we look at, it's more active in people with psychiatric disorders 
compared that are not autism compared to people with no psychiatric disorder. Brain areas that do arousal and emotion and executive control, active brains, and yet these same people, their physiology shuts down. This is heart rate deceleration in people with psychopathology compared to not. What I'm going to suggest then is it's a very usual picture that the brain may be reactive and the body gets cut off. And there's good reason for it. Remember I said you get these feedback loops between feeling the hair standing up on your neck and the vigilance system, which makes us more emotional. And it's like, oh, I'm upset. So my body reacts, which makes me react more. And you can imagine if your palms start sweating and your heart starts beating fast and you start breathing shallowly, it might augment panic. And that's what we think a panic attack actually is. And so if you have a mechanism that cuts you off from your body, it could actually be regulatory. But it could also stop your escape routes, stop you from cognitively recruiting regulatory resources or socially recruiting other people to help or stop your motor systems from allowing you to go walk away from something that's bothersome. Think about it like a body that can't sweat, which releases hot um, the heat so it can't cool down and it increases and that's sustained unregulated reactivity can be overwhelming could be a source of distress. Um, we modeled this computationally where if you cut off introception, cut off the body, it's as good as cutting off that vigilance or threat activity. The brain, the pictures of brain activity would be the same compared to an area which the functioning introceptive and increased vigilance system reactivity. So everything keeps going and going in the system with the increased activity. If you either cut off vigilance or cut off introception, they act basically the same way to regulate the system. Um, in people who are autistic, we have seen uh, that the brain desynchronizes. Areas that perceive visual information get disconnected from areas that integrate that information into the rest of the brain, like MT. So this correlation between V1, which perceives the visual information, and MT, which starts to integrate it. In autism, the more your V1 is responding, the less MT gets that information. Whereas in neurotypical people, it's exactly the opposite. The more you're perceiving visual information, the more you're integrating it. So it's actually this desynchronization, this disintegration that happens in autism. I want to also give you a model that resonates for a lot of autistic people, but we don't have a lot of evidence for it yet on how this could be, which is what if signal builds up in, um, oh, I don't even have the model here, builds up in this vigilance pathway and in the motor pathway is coming out but doesn't get to the level of action. So it's like you start to accumulate evidence that you should do something, but the firing threshold to actually act is higher in an autistic person. What would that look like? All this information accumulates, this drive to act accumulates, and there's no movement, no movement, no movement, until bam, and you get spasms, and you get wild movements, and you get wild variation in emotion. And you get, might get screaming for help rather than gently asking for it. To me, that feels and looks a lot like what a meltdown might be if you just had a higher firing threshold for getting out of this vigilance system. So how do we address it? Um, and I want to turn now to thinking about how we might address these things at the individual level and the societal level. Well, I've said what we might have is a state where we want to reconnect mind and body. And it turns out we can do this. And it turns out maybe autistic people are already doing some of it. If you look at what is often called quote unquote self-harm in autistic people, it's things that are categorized like hand rubbing or occasional contact with a surface while I'm rocking or 
sucking on fingers or picking nails. These are these desperate attempts to connect with our bodies, slapping our thighs, poking at orifices, poking at eyes. What if that is all self-stimulation and hopes to reconnect with our bodies? I'm gonna suggest that when I talk to autistic people about it, they say, yeah, for me, a lot of what other people perceive as hurting myself is actually just working to reconnect, just self-stimulation, because I can't feel myself. And it turns out that this might not even be that atypical. My student, Ashley Dukas, took people's cell phones away from them for 15 minutes and asked them to sit in a room and not use their cell phone. And she said, you have one button and you can push it. And if you push that button, I'm gonna tell you what happens. It's going to shock you. It's not gonna be a pleasant shock. And sometimes it'll be a very high volume shock. And it turns out that most of the people chose to shock themselves rather than just sitting there because they became so disconnected, they needed to just feel something. That wasn't surprising to me. What's surprising to me is they kept doing it and they shocked themselves even when they were told it would be a fairly intense shock. These were not masochists. These were allegedly neurotypical people in New York. It's just what people do. We've said, is there a kinder, gentler route? We found vibration actually works. Um, and so with this group, Apollo Neuroscience, these were my postdocs at the time at Pitt actually, we started just letting people experience calming vibration. Um, we called it purr at the time because it simulated the effect of like a cat purring on your chest. And we did that and people's heart rate variability was restored. Um, the regulatory is an index of regulatory capacity. Um, and people were able to focus on tasks more. We had different kinds of vibration people could choose. Things were, were just very calming were things that helped them focus, which were a little faster and more intense. And then if you were shut down, it helped to actually just experience thumping as a vibration. And so we let, gave you a watch that did all these things. First people we tried it with were people who had post-traumatic stress disorder, and they said it helped them return from shutdown states, and it helped them focus when they wanted to and regulate their emotions more, and it helped them sleep better when they put on the calm vibrations. Um, we haven't done a trial yet in autistic people. I tried it with one autistic person and he said, it's great, but I need it to come on automatically. So I said, when do you need it to come on? And he said, when I start having the kinds of reactions that say that I am getting toward a meltdown, what are those? And he says, it's my arms and my hands. I start wringing my arms, wringing my hands. So we said, okay. And we gave him this little device that measured arm activity and arm muscle activity. And it and we put a classifier on and we were able to classify when he started to drum his hands and shake and wring his hands and started to march, which was like for him the last stage. And we had the vibration come on when he would do these things. And he said it was awesome, that it was exactly what he needs, something that would come in and exogenously regulate him when he couldn't do it for himself. Did a whole trial with people who ruminated, saying when you start to ruminate, you're gonna see an X come up on the screen sometimes. And when you see an X, I just want you to push a button. And if they didn't push a button within half a second, we just had a gentle vibration, same device on their shoulder come and vibrate. And what it turns out is they learn to not ruminate so much and be able to come back from rumination and their brain's attention network was able to be recruited more efficiently. So what we're getting from this is that we can help people when they want to, to come back from these states um, and their rumination decreased and their EEG index on savoring um, of paying attention to just that went up. Uh, Kim Young at Pitt has done the same kind of thing with neurofeedback. She lets people see what their vigilance system is doing and they can up or down regulate it. She teaches them to upregulate their vigilance system to happy things. And it turns out they can do it. And it's proportional to getting better from depression. If you learn to upregulate your amygdala to happy things, 
the paper we just submitted, which is actually really cool, and I forgot to put in the slide on it, says that it also, if you just learn to upregulate better, you learn to downregulate better when um, you want to not be so emotional. We have another study on reconnecting people's minds and bodies where we have four different interventions, mindful awareness and breath focus and vibration, and then vibration that is associated with your breathing. So you can actually feel when you are breathing, it explicitly reconnects for you your mind and your body when you can't feel it. We've just published a pilot study saying that introception goes up and your dissociation goes down when you have breath vibration augmented breath focus versus just being told to concentrate on your breathing, which is hard. People say they become less numb every day they do it. Any of these, especially the vibration augmented breath focus, their feelings of being numb decrease. Their disengagement de decreases. Their emotional re attention regulation and emotional awareness goes up. Their mindfulness goes up. Their dissociation goes down. So altogether, connect people's minds and bodies, and it addresses a lot of the features that we would associate with autistic inertia. Now we just have to try this in people with autism or autistic people. We've analyzed what brain networks change. And these interventions recruit the brain networks you would want, particularly the interoceptive network for with both vibration and the vibration augmented breath focus and awareness. Tell people to focus on their breath and it doesn't actually recruit that interoceptive system. That's hard. You might want to give them some help. And the executive systems, these task systems and executive control systems are also being brought online. So we're very enthusiastic about the potential for these mind-body connection interventions. I want to skip a few slides here for time so we have time for questions. But um, get to societal change, because I don't think that the burden of dealing with being locked in should always necessarily fall only on the autistic person, given that it happens for so many people in so many situations. And maybe if people understood what locked in is about, they would understand what meltdowns about and are shutting down are about. And these things would be less scary to people who are seeing them, and maybe they would be less stigmatized. So how would this look if we were to address this at the societal level? Well, there is a canonical model that a guy named James Gross came up with of how emotion re regulation works in neurotypical people. You have a situation where you see that the situation might have something threatening, and then you modify the situation or you modify your cognitions. And by understanding you've made that response, you regulate your emotions. And you could think of this as the salient system coming and telling the prefrontal cortex, this executive system, hey, I need you some help here. And it just says, great, I'll do that, and then down regulates the salient system. He said, this is how things work for most people most of the time. That's fine. Um, we can simulate that in these computational networks with these areas that I told you about before. And you get these nice waves uh, when a threat is present where the salient system comes up and the executive system comes, the threat comes up, the salient system comes up, the executive system comes up to meet it, and that drives down the threat or salient system. And that's how it would work. And it would give you these nice emotion waves which have been observed empirically. What I'm going to suggest is that this picture is actually pretty rare. Natural systems don't work in smooth waves. They're much more like catastrophes where things build up and build up and then explode and come tumbling down. You can think of it like piling sand on a hill, up, 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 until it all falls out. That happens in physiological systems, and it happens for people. So my friend Toby Loftus is a violin player in um, an orchestra. He says, for classical musicians, a common anxiety is forgetting something important, like your instrument or shoes or something. I usually carry an extra bow tie on me in case some fellow has forgotten his. Tonight, getting dressed for my performance, I opened up my tux jack and found no pants. 
For the first time in 16 years, I forgot something kind of important. And it's not like I could hide. I was sitting in the very front center, right in front of the conductor. How would you react? How would a neurotypical person, Toby is the height of neurotypical, in fact, react to this? It might not be that gentle regulation. It might be a little bit of freaking out, right? And we said, what if we vary that salient system activity just a little bit? And it turns out tiny variations create the salient system running away, an executive control system not really being able to regulate it. And that's the majority of parameters that we looked at. The well regulated system is the minority. Why should we say it's what people should do or are generally like? And what we found is that neurotypical people aren't that way. We've told 196 people to please allow us to induce a sad mood. We had them think about negative things and we played them very sad music. And 60% of them didn't go there. They rated their sadness at one out of five after 15 minutes. Um, we had people listen to criticism by their loved ones and said, how sad or sad are you from that criticism? And it turns out most people wouldn't go there. They wouldn't allow themselves to react. Is it something humans can't react to? We did the experiment, same experiment in Japan where um, people actually will don't like emotion very much, but will have an emotion if they're asked to because they prioritize doing what an experimental says there, and they were able to get sad just fine. So it's just something where people won't go there. We said we looked at the extreme of physiological stimulation, where we did something called orgasmic meditation with sexual touch for 15 minutes. And a third of the people's arousal systems, their vigilance system measured by galvanic skin response, actually went up and stayed there, but another third shut down. These people didn't say it was terribly negative, but they did say, I didn't go to a high arousal place. I was doing the work. I was using it to meditate. So is shutting down, what if it's normative? And so we gave people the opportunity. We took 210 people and gave them the opportunity to use canonical strategies we talk about all the time, like reappraise or distract, or shut down. Just shut off your emotions, just like that. Is that something neurotypical people could do? Well, it turns out um, just about everybody, 210 out of 211 were able to do it and use that sometimes when they were given the option. And the mean uses of 20 trials where they could shut down, they used it on almost nine of them. People with psychopathologies tended to use it more than people who were who did not have any psychopathology. And it was associated with decreased heart rate reactivity. So all in all, what I'm getting from this is that shutting down is common, shutting down physiologically. Um, and it turns out we've known this for years and years. Back in um, the early part of the 1900s, 1928, von Restorff demonstrated an effect which um, was replicated in 2002 by a guy named Schmidt where he showed people a deck of cards and you're turning over card after card after card. And then one of the cards showed a person who could either be nude or have clothes on. And the nude, if, um, and it turns out when you saw nude people, you did not recall the cards before or after it. Um, everybody recalled seeing the nude person, but not the um, cards that became before or after it because it just clouded out their memory. We went to the scare house in downtown Pittsburgh and we measured people's brains after being scared in a scary haunted house and their brains shut down even though they were physiologically aroused. So it's kind of the opposite set. Um, what I want to get to with all of this, maybe we don't always need to intervene or stop meltdowns as much as have people recognize that this is something that happens that people react fairly extremely sometimes, and that canonical regulation strategies don't always cut it, but allowing people to, for example, self-stimulate and do the kinds of things that would help them, maybe they know, 
Don't give any instructions. Don't tell them they have to accept. Um, so that tends to work it actually. It, um, or saying you can accept your emotions or don't not showing them how to regulate tends to work just as well. I think there's a lot of room for teaching tolerance of other people's emotions. Having relationships, so often in relationships, people say, hey, look, I'm upset now. You have to actually um, talk to me about this or you seem upset. You have to talk about it. What if we recognize that often the avenues that would let us get something out of our brain just aren't functioning when we get upset and not having words is actually more typical, especially for autistic people. And what if workplaces allowed that? My wife says works in computer science and she says it's increasingly OK for people to say I'm not coming into work today because I'm so stressed. And we're allowing emotions to be a reason to not come in. I have a friend who said my boss saw that I was upset. She was crying. And she took me downstairs to the loading dock and said, this is where I come to cry. Rather than stigmatizing it, rather than saying that's something you can't do, making it OK and making a vehicle so that people can sit with the affect they have, saying meltdowns are just going to happen is how we're wired. Um, and maybe it's OK to want to be alone when that happens. Emotion contagion is real. Turns out that if you're upset, it may make other people upset. And maybe sometimes the way we deal with that is to want to lock our door or get where people aren't. And maybe that's doing a service and maybe you should be able to say that. Um, I'll note that masking, that is when we're very upset, trying to not show it, takes cognitive work. It takes effort. And that effort make it in the way of doing other things. And this need to mask that we currently have may hit some people harder than others. There's gender and cultural inequality in it. Turns out it's really in our society not OK for women or black men to show anger. And so that yields increased emotional labor at masking these very natural reactions, which means they may not be able to get their work done in the same way because they're having to put in so much more effort at masking things that it's unclear why they would should have to. So in my lab, we're doing an experiment. It's what we do. We say, what if it was explicitly OK for us to have emotions? You're allowed to cry in the workplace. You're allowed to be very upset. And you're encouraged to tell people your affective state if you can and if you have the resources to do that. I sometimes will wear a physiological monitor so anybody can see exactly what's going on for me. Um, what you're we encourage people to not make it a toxic environment. So try and not take it out on other people. But you're allowed to have a meltdown. And it turns out people are really grateful for this in my lab. Um, and they feel like they can get their work done because they're not spending their whole time masking. I want to finish just by noting that we have a big center for this now. Um, there, Pitt has been awarded a $10 million Autism Center of Excellence by the National Institute of Health, um, where we've got a big study to look at locked in and screaming inside, the LISI study, um, which is measuring autistic and neurotypical people's brains when they do hard things like hearing criticism or seeing flashing checkerboards or seeing really difficult content words or sitting still for five minutes, which actually is very hard and is associated with making your eyes bug out and move all over the place, which gets that cerebellar activity. All right. Where we've been. And I didn't write a slide of conclusions because I think really we have more questions than answers. What I've tried to say today is that. Potentially. Autistic inertia, the phenomenon of getting locked in inside and not being able to get out when you want to and not recruit resources for regulation, for asking for help or for taking yourself out of a situation. Perhaps that's not so unfamiliar. Perhaps it's something that happens more for autistic people and autistic people have some ways of coping with it. They've um, come up with. It may be useful to help people be able to better integrate their mind and body if an autistic person 
wants to try and do that, we have the technology and we should be doing these studies we plan to coming up. But also there may be some room for society to step back and say, hey, what if it's OK if people are having a meltdown? I see why it's because you're locked in and maybe I don't need to be banging loudly on the door the whole time as that's happening. Or maybe I can support you. Maybe I can give you an environment where there is less sensory information coming in. Maybe I can say, hey, is there anything that would help? Should I dim the lights? Do we need a weighted blanket or something and make that just part of life? And I will stop there. I want to thank a whole bunch of people. In particular, I have collaborators on a lot of the work I've said. Nothing I could have done today could have been done alone. We have a lovely, lovely lab of um, people who've worked on blunted emotions, people who um, uh, have worked on the trauma and um, many psychopathology study. I told you about the shutting down study and the shutting down work. Wendy D'Andrea has been a pioneer at the New School for Social Research of Understanding Shutting Down, the group that developed the Apollo vibration system with me, um, team of people who are currently working on this ACE Center. Carla Mazepsky is the PI on that. Kate Gotham and Yukari Takari are co-investigators, and we have a lot of other collaborators on the ACE Center. Um, my current lab, who are lovely people and just so value them, the dissociation study at Emory, and then my the neurofeedback lab headed by Kim Young that I mentioned. Um, also, I mentioned a bunch of other studies we've done um, with other groups of people. Again, it takes a village to do this kind of work. So, and people who've been in my lab recently. So with that, I wanna stop here. I'm gonna stop sharing slides and um, take questions. Please feel free to unmute. Please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A, and please feel free to turn on your cameras if you would like. We have about 10 minutes left. Hi, Dr. Siegel, this is uh, Jessica Kettle. Um, Hi, I don't Jessica. know if we've met before, but I'm the inpatient attending of, of one of them on the sixth floor. And I had a question, or maybe it's more of a discussion point. Um, I'm always curious when I see, especially motion dysregulation research, about how much of it is, well, how much of it is done on a patient population um, that does not have intellectual disability and does have language, um, and if it's if we should interpret it similarly or differently for people who do have language impairments who do have intellectual disability. I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for asking that. I am so happy you did. Um, if you remember my first slide, I've said almost all the work we have done has on uh, in information processing and emotional information processing in autism has been with people who are verbal people who are lower services needs um and people who have who do not have severe intellectual disability our knowledge of the people who are nonverbal and who have more severe disability in terms of how emotion regulation plays out in the brain is in its infancy. We need to be doing this work. And whether, how much of what I say generalizes, I really can't be sure. What I can say, as you know, intellectual disability goes with autism. There is some relationship between emotion dysregulation and intellectual disability in that people who have less executive control and cognitive control do tend to have less control over emotions as well, because that takes overriding these um, inertial impulses. So in other populations, that's what we've found. Um, and it turns out when we train executive control with people, they get more control over rumination and more control over their emotions. But we haven't done that work yet in autism and we just need to. If you have thoughts on it, please feel free to unmute again. I wish I wish I had like here's more, but thank you so much. Um, 
while we're looking, I just I did just write a section on intellectual disability, and I want to see. I cited a reference. Um, OK, yeah, so people with intellectual disability who are autistic. Do tend to have other psychopathologies more, including depression. Um, autism has specifically been linked with this cognitive inflexibility or the disability in shifting between different thoughts and tasks which is going to play into this autistic inertia um, notion really strongly. So decreased cognitive flexibility is also associated with depression. So I am going to suggest that a lot of the emotion dysregulation may come with these specific kinds of intellectual disability that we find in autism. Other questions? Could I ask a quick follow up to that? Yes. <laughs> do you think that applies as well to people who do not have autism, but just have intellectual disability? Um, it turns out it pro um, intellectual disability in general is at least associated with psychopathology. Um, the extent to which it is associated with to which decreased flexibility um, is the culprit that that will vary between people. Other questions? I just had a question. I'm I'm Jackie. I'm the chaplain at Western Psychiatric Hospital, and I was just wondering, you know, when you listed some of the symptoms, some of those symptoms you can see in other people that don't have autism or are not diagnosed with autism. So how do you know what is autism versus, you know, or is it just that we're all on the spectrum and that could just be like an autistic moment? All right, so I think if we get anything from what I tried to say today, it's that a lot of the features that are present in autistic people are not unique to autistic people. People who are autistic may tend to experience these as their every day. And they may and it and so I would go as far as to say it's possible that a lot of people have at some point had a meltdown, maybe in response to some more extreme stressor. And if you understand that it, what it's like from your one experience of having had a meltdown 10 years ago, you might be able to relate to somebody like me who has them on a real, regular basis. Um, so I'm not going to go as far as to say that everybody's aut autistic um, as much as I will say that the that autistic people are not from another planet. They just may have some of these experiences more, more intensely, more frequently. We've probably all worn a shirt that is uncomfortable for us. Autistic people find a whole lot of shirts are uncomfortable for them. The other question I have, when you talked about masking, particularly among women and blacks, um, how do you break out of that cycle? Right. Or is um, there a way to break out of that cycle or what's the best way to manage? That is that is such a huge and hard question. What I would direct you to is Google um, the term social determinants of health, which basically says that there are so things are not disabilities unless we make them as a society disabilities. And if society is stigmatizing certain behaviors, being in a wheelchair, for example, is not actually a problem unless wheelchair, unless you have non-wheelchair accessible places. And so if society has decided to stigmatize some people and some people more than others for having emotions, I'd say that's on society and we need campaigns and we need consciousness raising efforts 
to say, hey, don't do that. I think that there have been some, and it's been gradually starting um, to, you know, you've been gradually starting to hear it um, in, in some cultural sensitivity training and um, DEI sensitive um, environments. I think basically a lot of places now have some level of DEI training that the diversity, equity, inclusion training that is required. And I think in part of that, sensitizing people to their privilege of being able to have an emotion and not be stigmatized for it and sensitizing people to the extent, the extent to which they stigmatize other people and say, suppose you're walking down the street and you see an angry white person versus an angry black person, would you react differently? And if they do, perhaps you want to check yourself on that and, you know, learn to react differently. If that's part of our everyday upbringing and we have that in the schools, maybe we can do something. It's not going to be an overnight thing, as you, I'm sure, well know. Yes, thank you so much. This was very informative.